what I am in terms of leadership, who worked hand in hand. But I say to you, I have good memories. But I ask of you to let go of me to answer the call of national duty. Let me, in a particular way, thank my colleagues who are here because they've been friends beyond colleagues. The Minister for Local Government, Honorable Otuoma, was part of my youth league before he became a member of Parliament. Many times he was locked in and we got him out. <laughs> but he is here with us today. There are members of the diplomatic corps who are here, and in particular, without trying to singularize one, let me thank Her Excellency, the German Ambassador, Margit, for the work you've done for the people of Katanga. Allow me to thank my boss, Minister of Paranya. A man who worked hand in hand with me as my boss, but in unpartisan politics, despite being in a different divide of politics. A man who will always ask me to be in his office before we undertake any decision of the ministry. A man who never felt insecure of me being his deputy. Mr. Minister, sir, we played different roles in our lives. As you rightfully said, I was once your boss. Today you are my boss. After 4th of March, I'll be your boss. <laughs> my son, Andrew, you've really grown of age. <laughs> And when you stood here to speak, I wasn't sure I would have any more energies to speak. <laughs> and I would have easily told you what to speak for me, because I never believed at 19 years of age, you'd have that courage to deliver a wonderful speech. <laughs> to my family, and they are here, I know I've been absent, trying to work for the people of Gatanga, trying to transverse the whole country. I know, especially the extended family of Gatanga, you've missed me this year for quite some time. But I knew I was always there. We want to make this a campaign of issues and deliverables. I have transversed over 43 counties in the last one year. And the problems that continue to ail our people remain the same. Whether you are in West Pokot, whether you are in Kuala, whether you are in Moyale, the problems continue to be the same. This campaign will not be about Peter Kennedy. This campaign will be about our issues. <laughs> and we must not personalize this campaign because it's about you. It must be about your issues. It must be about what we can do for our country. We have serious challenges extremely serious challenges. In fact, when I look at them, they are twin challenges. We have a high rate of unemployment. 40% rate of unemployment. Yet we know that 52% of our population is below 18 and we ain't seen nothing yet. 
We also know, we also know that 70% of the unemployed are young people below the age of 35 and below. And if we do nothing now, we'll blame ourselves in the next five years. We are 41 million Kenyans today, and we are hungry. We are growing at the rate of 1.2 million a year. In 10 years, we'll be 53 million Kenyans. I want you to ponder for a minute and ask yourself, if we are hungry at 41 million, what will we be at 53 million? <laughs> These two challenges are things that we have to deal with now, not next year, not the year to come. There are current issues that we must deal with. And they give me the greatest motivation to stand before you and tell you first, we must fix security in our country. And I know that even as I stand in front of you, there was an attack in a church in Garissa this morning and we lost two Kenyans because of insecurity. We will never create opportunities in our country. We will never bring local investors or foreign investors if we have insecurity. I am proud of our men and women who went all the way to protect our borders into Somalia. And I know that we can be proud of our men and women in uniform in police if we invest in security. As Ronnie told you, I grew up in Bahati in Islands. At a time when security was at top range, when a police station had 20 police cars, 18 on patrol for 200 kilometers a night, and two on reserve in case any of the 18 was not on the road. We now know the situation today. We probably have two vehicles in each police station, one probably for the boss, and the other one without fuel for patrol. And I feel for our police. They are poorly paid. They are short of vehicles to the tune of 3,000 as we speak. And they do not have housing units amounting to about 27,000 un 27, units. If we invest in security, and we must invest in security, then we will have an opportunity. And this is what I want to create so that everybody has an opportunity to invest in our country. Two, we need and we must grow our infrastructure. And I've seen Kenyans settle where the roads are, and the danger of it is that we tend to settle where there is agricultural land. And the danger in it is that we replace agricultural land with stones because of settlement. I would like to see a situation where we decentralize the fuel petroleum levy so that we can grow all our 47 counties at the same pace and allow Kenyans the freedom to go wherever they want to go in Kenya. a situation where we open our country. We must open our roads from Mazeras going to Kuala, going to Diani, if we must take the advantage of the potential in Diani. We must open up the roads from Mazeras going to Ganze, going all the way to Kilifi, if we must take advantage. We must accept that the cost of new ferries and maintenance of them is more expensive than putting up a, a bridge over Likoni Channel. We must accept that many of our people waste a lot of time in traffic jams and that most of our jams in urban areas have today become car parks. And therefore we must see how to decongest our cities. We must see how to bring in public transport. 
we must see how our rain will work so that we don't have a burden on our roads. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are a water scarce country. And for a long time we've depended on rain fed agriculture, it won't do because of climate change. We must now deliberately build dams and conserve water because we need water to drink, but with a growing population, you'll need water for irrigation. And now I'm ready to ensure that each county has its own dam so that we can do irrigation at each county and have water for each county. When I was growing up in Bahati, the best healthcare facility was Bahati Dispensary. I didn't have to think of any other. And if things got worse, the best next place to go was Jericho Health Center because things worked from a healthcare situation. But today all these facilities have been outstretched and overstretched because we have not invested despite a growing population. And we know that today Kenyans are suffering from lifestyle diseases like diabetes, cancers, and high blood pressure, and that if we do nothing about it, we'll soon not have any population. We've also seen recently that the medics have taken to the streets. I feel for them. I know they took the Hippocratic oath, but they are frustrated. They are in hospitals, but they are not able to take care of the patients. And when they take to the streets, it's the poor who suffer. I'm therefore committed to ensure that in the next three years, the 45 counties that do not have referral hospitals will have referral hospitals. I am committed to ensure that those hospitals have enough doctors, have enough machines, have enough drugs, and have enough personnel. On education, I appreciate that we've had free primary education, but it's now time to move to the next level of having quality education. Quality education that will take us to the next level, that will take care of our vision 2030. Quality education that our economy requires. Quality education that will see our kids graduate and ready to work. But I also realize that 70% of our kids do not make it to the national universities. And I have say it is a must that we build a national polytechnic in each county to take care of the 70% that does not make it to university. And prepare them from a skill point of view so that they can go to other sectors of our economy. These are key fundamentals that we must do. They are key fundamentals that we need. They are key fundamentals in terms of service. Kenyans pay taxes for services, and they ought to get those services. Our economy has been growing at the rate of 4.3%. We've been struggling with the Honorable Minister. Because we know that Vision 2030 is envisaged on a growth of 10%. And if we are growing at 4.3, means we are starting to get off the mark of the vision. But most important for you is that at 4.3 is an economic growth of status quo. We are neither growing rich nor are we growing poor. So we are just there. And therefore, we must see to it that we build our economy. And I want to use four sectors to uplift our economy. I want to use the agricultural sector because if our farmers are aware and are guaranteed that they will make money from their produce, they are going to go to farming. <laughs> Successful agricultural-based economy have had subsidies for agriculture. We don't need to go that route. 
but we need to assure that young farmer in Washungishu that if he plants his maize, he will get everything he paid for that maize. That will create self-employment, but will also boost food security. The tourist sector is another sector that can boost our economy. It has spiral effect in our economy. At the moment, we are only getting 1.6 million tourists in Kenya. Yet we know that the potential that Kenya has is not even exploited. We know that despite the two areas where tourism is very popular, we have not invested. You look at the coast province, and you realize that we should have done all the roads and all the bridges to ensure more tourists get to the coast province. You look at the Maasai Mara, and you get embarrassed when you watch tourists getting stuck. Yet, we have not invested. And I want to tell you here today, despite many of us flocking in the lake region of Kisumu and the shores of Mombasa, we also have Lake Trukana, which has 800 kilometers of the shoreline unexploited. That is how much our potential is. <laughs> but we have no roads, and we are not secure. That's why I said we must fix the fundamentals. It takes me aback when I get results of the tourists who have come to Kenya as 1.6. That is what a three kilometer stretch of shopping in London gets on a hot summer day. That is more, that is far much less than what the Roman Empire ruins get in Italy. Yet, we have the most beautiful country in the world. I can tell you this today. I've been to about 100 countries of the world, and I have not seen a more beautiful country than Kenya. Yeah. And it hurts me that we keep losing opportunities when we should actually be taking advantage of opportunities. Because if we pushed our numbers to about 4.3, 4.5 million tourists, we will have a spiral effect in our economy that will create opportunities for many millions of young people who do not have opportunities in Kenya. I told you we must have national polytechnics because the other sector that we must deal with is manufacturing. We must set free our investors in the manufacturing sector. And I feel for them. Most of them are relocating. Because they go to the neighborhood where they are secure. They go to the neighborhood where the roads are there. But when they are here, and they just take the security subsector, they have to pay for CCTV, they have to pay for laser wire, they have to pay for alarms, they have to pay for dogs, they have to pay for watchmen and women. All these add to the cost of production and makes our country very, very expensive. And therefore, we must see how to define the manufacturing sector in our country. We must see how to help it. We have signed good treaties. We have signed the East Africa Community. We have signed the Comesa, the Comesa Treaty. And these are trade agreements that we ought to take charge because we are a better place to take charge. We need, to create for, we need to create avenues for our young innovators. Young innovators because they have proved to the rest of the world that they are able. And ICT is here to stay. And we must ensure that our young men and women take advantage of innovation which they have to ensure they can be able to develop their products outside Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, those four sectors should be able to take our economy back to 10% and create enough opportunities for thousands and millions of Kenyans who are still jobless today. Yeah. I want to tell you this. As your president, I will set the bar very high next year. Yeah.
I will ensure that the constitution that we so much passed is implemented in full. I will ensure that the institutions that were supposed to be set up are operational. But I will also ensure that the rule of law is followed to the letter. Yeah. I want to assure you there is nobody who is above the law. Similarly, nobody will be below the law. Yeah. And I will ensure that the reforms in judiciary are accelerated further because I want to ensure there is very efficient dispensation so that crime does not pay in our country and we make sure that yeah. people pay for what they commit in our country. We have far too many things happening in forms of impunities because we do not punish. People escape despite committing crimes in our country. And I can assure you that we can be a deterrent by being efficient, by following the rule of law, and, ensure, and ensuring that everybody who makes a mistake pays for it. I was brought up, as Ronnie has told you, by a single parent. From what I've heard of Ronnie today, they were lucky they had two rooms. <laughs> We lived in one room with my mother. She's not here with us. I know she's watching this from her television set. And mama, I know you are proud wherever you are. Yeah. But she taught me discipline. She was tough as they come. And when I thought I was done and I was going into a boarding school in Form 1, she chose for me the Starry Boy Center. Not because I had it here, but she wanted more discipline instilled. I want to assure you, I will instill severe discipline in our fiscal management of our economy. When I left the Treasury just four years ago, the debt was just about 700 million. Today it has more than doubled. It's a price you have to pay. And that's why we must bring discipline. We must tighten our belts because we can't go on this way. We won't have a country. We cannot continue this way where we live beyond our means. We must ensure we have a tight and disciplined fiscal management system in our country so that we can make savings, savings that will plow back to finance the five fundamentals I told you about. Yeah. Savings that will go towards security, savings that will go towards infrastructure, Savings that will go towards water conservation. Savings that will go towards construction of new referral hospitals. Savings that will go towards reforms in our education sector. And I'm saying this because only nine years ago, the total collection from taxpayers was 180 billion. The total collection today is 750 billion which means that in the last nine years we've collected nearly 500 billion more. The unfortunate thing is that the recurrent expenses have outgrown the total collection. That's why I say discipline will be a must. <laughs> what has continued to ail us? And will continue to ail us until we make a break is tribalism. Yeah. 
We have taken the excuse of tribalism for poor leadership. We have taken the excuse of tribalism for weak leadership. We have taken the excuse of tribalism to actually plunder the country's resources. I tell you here today, I am in a unique position to ensure there is leadership that will end tribalism in our country. We never learned tribalism in primary schools. We did not learn it in secondary schools. We did not even learn it at the university. It was brought to us by poor leadership. Poor leadership that wanted to maintain the status quo. Poor leadership that wanted us to stay the same. I tell you today, I have told you, I'm in a very unique position to ensure there is no tribalism and that every Kenyan will feel proud under my leadership to feel proud to be a Kenyan. We have stayed in a historical bondage for a long time. We have stayed in a historical bondage for the last 49 years. I learned that history as a subject was supposed to teach us lessons. Unfortunately, we have stayed in history for the last 49 years. We have had the same characteristics of leadership for the last 49 years. And as somebody told me in Kuala last week, ni wale wale, na kama si wale wale, wanahusika na wale wale, na wanataka tukae pale pale, na tukae hivyo hivyo. That is a bondage we must break from. That is a bondage we must show that it's part of history. That is a bondage Kenya does not need if we chart a new route to where we want to go. That is a bondage that we must cut if we want the next five years to count. I grew up when the best example was a box. And we used to be told, you're either in the box, and when things got bad, you are told, get out of the box. I want to tell you Kenyans today, throw away the box. Free your mind. Throw away that box. Free your mind. You will have effective leadership when you free your mind. Leadership is about and must be about ability. Ability to work for the people of Kenya. Leadership must be about energized leadership. Leadership must be about passion. Leadership must be about love for the people of Kenya. Leadership must be about vision for the people of Kenya. These are strong tenets of leadership. And if that is what forms the basis of leadership, I want to tell you here today, and for those who are watching us, you need not look any further. You have it right here. As I conclude, let me say this. There are those who might try to discourage you. There are those who might try to distract you. There are those who've been in doubt. Tell them today marks the start of the journey. That today, the 4th of November, marks the start of the journey. The journey that will liberate our country. The journey that will break from the past. The journey that will be part of the fresh leadership that this country requires the journey that will propel our country to greater heights in the next five years. Because 
We must do it for Kenya. We must do it for ourselves. 